Good morning. Good morning to everybody at the uh, um, Science Buskers Fair. Uh, my name is Gordon Lindsay. I'm in Bristol in England. Um, and I've been asked uh, by the Broadcom Foundation to uh, give you a presentation that we wrote many years ago called Turning Sand into Fun. Uh, so now if I can make the technology work, I will share my screen and uh, show you the presentation. It seems I need to just change the setting. Okay, that one and share. And let me bring up some slides. So I hope you can all see this. Um, this is a presentation uh, that I I wrote having worked in the microchip business for, for many years. Um, and I was asked to write this by my children's school uh, who were having their science week back in 2012. Uh, and they knew I worked in the microchip business and they, they asked if I would explain what I did to the children. So we've used this with uh, many, many schools since then. Uh, and so I hope you'll, you'll enjoy it. Um, so what does Broadcom do? Uh, Broadcom uh, is the, the founder of the Broadcom Foundation. Um, well, it makes microchips, but it's not this kind of microchip. It's actually a very different type, uh, and it, 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 it's got things to do with everything you probably use every day. So if you use uh, any of these, uh, things like a music player uh, or a sat-nav or um, a headset, uh, then the chances are that you're actually using a chip from Broadcom somewhere inside one of those actual boxes. And the idea behind what Broadcom does is to connect everything together. So uh, whether it's a telephone system, whether it's your broadband, uh, connections to the storage facilities that you use, uh, something that, that Broadcom does links into all of those different kinds of, of devices, making sure that we can all connect together through everything. So where do we actually begin to start building these types of devices? Well, we actually start with sand. Would you believe it? There's lots and lots of sand in the world, and sand contains uh, lots of a mineral called silicon. And it was found many years ago that silicon uh, could be used as the base element for, for making uh, lots of electronic devices. Uh, and so uh, it's very lucky that we have so much of this uh, mineral readily available. But actually what we have to do is to take that sand and refine it down to a, a material called silica and then turn it into very large crystals of silicon. And, and you can see from the picture, the silicon crystals tend to be big tubular circles. Uh, and this is just a single, uh, single crystal of silicon grown in this way in a furnace. But then to actually make the chips, the uh, big crystal on the, on the left uh, is cut into many, many very thin slices, uh, typically about a millimeter thick and maybe uh, 300 millimeters across so that we have lots and lots of these slices from just one uh, very large crystal of, uh, of silicon. And this is where we start with uh, for, for the manufacture of microchips. And it's amazing that just to get to this base material requires all kinds of engineers and scientists, chemists, metallurgists, material scientists, crystallographers, uh, and many more engineers to build the machinery and the furnaces and the refinery uh, to be able to just get to this basic material. Um, so how do we actually use it to make anything? Well, uh, we use a device called a transistor. 
And the first transistor was demonstrated back in 1947 uh, at Bell Labs by a guy called William Shockley. And this is a picture of, of his apparatus, uh, which is in the Smithsonian Museum now uh, in the USA. Um, we moved on quite quickly. The, 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 the idea of the transistor, even though it was 70 years ago, has had a really profound impact on semiconductor in innovation. Previously, people used to use these large valves uh, in electronics, but then they realized they could use these tiny, tiny transistors and pack many more into the same space as a valve and be able to do many, many more things. Um, the transistor then evolved into what we know today as an integrated circuit, where we use many, many transistors inside of one chip. And it was actually voted that this invention actually had more impact on society than any other invention in the last hundred years. Uh, because we use them today in, in almost everything we, we actually use uh, has some kind of integrated circuit or microprocessor uh, built into it. Well, so what is a transistor and what does it actually do? Well, a transistor is actually like a tap that we have um, to, for controlling water. And if you think of water and electric current, what we do is we use the tap to control the flow. You can either turn it on a small amount or you can turn it all the way on to have a very strong flow. So a very small movement of the tap can produce a very strong flow of water or electric current. So it can actually be an amplifier device or it can be a switching device as well if we just turn the tap all the way on and then all the way off again. So this is a very, very simple circuit. We can actually have uh, a LED and a transistor and we touch our finger on it and the LED will actually flash on and off um, just through the control of our finger in, in a simple circuit like this. And this is very easy to use a transistor just to do on and off. But actually, a transistor can do a lot more than just an on and off operation. You can have very simple operations, but you can then be able to signal things like left and right, hot and cold, good and bad, light and dark, and even up and down, or open and close. So you can start to use transistors for many, many different applications where you need to indicate something uh, and show a, a sensor, sensory response. But transistors can be connected together and make much more complex in circuits and functions. But wires and connectors are unreliable. So you can imagine opening a laptop and finding lots and lots of wires like this. Well, a, a laptop would not survive for very long um, because these wires would tend to move, they would tend to break, and, and they become very, very unreliable. So the idea of the integrated circuit to manufacture all the transistors into one chip uh, became the goal for engineers to develop. And in 1958, a gentleman by the name of Jack Kilby invented the process for the integrated circuit. Uh, and it actually had just two transistors connected together uh, on this one circuit. Uh, and this was back in many, many years ago now in, in 1958. But gradually things moved forward. And as we got to 1971, Intel introduced the first microprocessor called the 4004. And this actually had 2,300 transistors now uh, incorporated into the single microchip. It ran at 108 kilohertz and it used a 10 micron line width. So the width of the transistor was 10 microns across. And this was uh, 49 years ago that this was first developed as the first microprocessor. So who likes cake? Because developing interest, integrated transistors is actually like making a cake in layers. 
the design of the transistor is is designed such that we have layers that sit on top of each other in in a vertical fashion just like the chocolate cake on the left um, and this is a perfect way to actually do mass production of integrated circuits an integration means lower system cost higher reliability and much better quality and we can change the performance of these transistors by changing the uh, ratio of W and L as shown in the diagram. And W is the width of the transistor and L is the length uh, of the transistor. And this pretty much sets what the performance of the transistor is going to be. Making microchips is actually like using a potato stamp where you make a design and then you make lots and lots of copies of that same design. So we do one design uh, of, uh, of a device, and this is a plot of, uh, of a complete microchip. And then we actually put that onto the silicon wafers that I mentioned earlier on, uh, and we reproduce it many, many times. And you can see in the, in the picture uh, that there are many little copies of the same thing. And there may be five or 10,000 copies into that one single wafer. Uh, so it, it, it really expands the manufacturing capacity that you can get on, on one single wafer uh, of a design and replicate many, many designs uh, in one go. So about 40 years ago, uh, a man named Gordon Moore, who was the founder of Intel, in fact, um, came up with this rule that the transistor density roughly doubles every two years in each new process generation. And the first microprocessor that Intel developed had around about 2,000 transistors. So that was back in 1971 and 72. And Moore's law actually predicted that every couple of years you would double the number of transistors. So the graph follows that rule. And, and by 2012, you could be uh, actually including 4 billion transistors onto a single chip. And even now, um, people have moved on to even 10 billion transistors as we are in, in 2020. Uh, so the rule continues to actually be uh, quite true although because of the diameter of the silicon atom being 0.25 nanometers, we begin to approach the atomic limit. And so Moore's law will slow down eventually one day, but there's still not too many signs of, of that happening. But in just those 40 years, we have moved from 2000 transistors on a chip to 4 billion, which is an incredible increase in complexity and the ability to add lots and lots of uh, incredible features onto, onto some of our devices. So why is there this constant desire to make things smaller and to shrink them down? Well, it means we can get more features per square millimeter. And, and consequently, more functions on a chip. So things like phones get smaller, computers get smaller, um, because we can pack more into them. We can also make a much smaller chip even for existing functions. And that means we can get more of the uh, chips on the wafer and be able to manufacture in higher volume, which gives us a lower cost for device. One of the other things with making the device smaller is that they tend to use lower power. So we can actually make things which can be powered by batteries or solar cells uh, easier as we go for the sm smaller and smaller technologies. Uh, we also get very high reliability and you can build things which are called systems on a chip because you can add so many devices and so many different features. And obviously, some chips are required in very, very high volume for providing broadband or mobile phone or even televisions. Uh, and today, we can actually get to very, very high speeds, you know, from the one kilohertz that Intel first used in, 4, uh, in the 4004 device, 
we can now get to 100 gigahertz uh, on the devices which are developed today. So you can make very complex integrated circuits, and this allows us to make super products, things like the Raspberry Pi, which has this one very complex chip in the middle of it, uh, which was developed by Broadcom, uh, and provides all of the functions that the Raspberry Pi needs for computing, for the video, for audio, uh, for the memory, uh, and for connections to the internet uh, as well. So really, without the technological change, devices like this would have been very, very difficult to produce. And can you imagine a device like a Raspberry Pi with lots and lots of wires all over it? It really just wouldn't be very reliable. So having an integrated chip uh, like this makes these things really very possible. So to a lot of today's transistors and a lot of the products which are, are developed use a transistor where the W parameter is 40 nanometers. And 40 nanometers is 0. 0.00004 millimeters. So they are really, really tiny devices. 40 nanometers, compared with some of the things you will know, a particle of dust is 20,000 nanometers. So that's between 500 and potentially 12,000 times bigger than the transistor which is used in a, in a microchip. A, a strand of your hair is 99,000 nanometers. So that's nearly 2,500 times the size of the, the transistor which is used today in, the, in a microchip. And please don't sneeze. Please don't sneeze anywhere near your microchips because viruses uh, particles are between 10 and 300 nanometers. And uh, I checked uh, what the size of the COVID-19 virus is, and it's 120 nanometers. So as you can see in the picture, people who work in microchip produ production have to keep the production facility very, very clean. So everybody has to wear these lovely suits and face masks continuously. Um, and if anybody has the slightest cold or sneezing, they don't come into work on, uh, on that day. They, they have to stay away because it can ruin production very, very quickly. A lot of the production today is done by robots in clean uh, factories. Um, but there's still a lot of a lot of people and engineers involved. So to design a chip is quite a long process. A lot of the chips that we design start with a customer, and a customer has an idea about what they actually want. And so from that, we develop what are the marketing requirements. And once the marketing requirements are finished, we actually move on to the circuit design and design the, the, the actual transistors which are needed. And then we have to do something called the chip layout, which is to put all of the pieces together um, so that they will actually fit on the chip and the areas of the chip are not too hot or too cold because that can stress the, the silicon as well. And once we're finally happy with the layout, then we can move to manufacturing and packaging and testing before we actually ship something to the customer. And this whole processor from, cust from customer right the way around to shipping will take about two years normally. Um, it's really quite a long process to be able to get something from somebody's idea to having a chip sample in their hands. So we talked earlier about systems on a chip, and this is uh, an area which is evolved where you can have complete solutions uh, to do certain functions all built into a chip. And you can take an example like a simple mobile phone, which has uh, the RF and the cellular baseband and a Bluetooth uh, device and power management for charging the battery. And this is a phone from maybe 2005, 2006 uh, kind of time period. But if you take the kinds of things you can do with a smartphone today, 
you have a lot more blocks uh, built into it. You can have an application processor for running all of your apps. You now have Wi-Fi as well as Bluetooth and maybe an FM radio. Uh, you still have the cellular, but it's got more complex with 3G and 4G and 5G. Uh, you have GPS for sat-nav. You might have functions to display mobile TV and touch control and things like this. But all of those parts are designed just like the Lego bricks shown in the diagram. They are designed as pieces which are then connected to, together. And they'll probably be designed by different teams of engineers, even maybe in, in different countries. Uh, this is uh, an example of uh, using some of the Broadcom design centers uh, in many, many different locations where engineers have certain expertise in a certain part of the chip. So they will do their block and then that block will be passed to another team. So it becomes a very, very fabulous team effort uh, using the best talent from around the world to make a complete system on a chip design. And the weird thing is that even when you've designed a, a chip like this, the chip really doesn't do anything um, without any software. Almost, almost every chip today requires some kind of software program to tell them what to do. And without that, they do very little at all. So as well as engineers to design the chip, there is always a huge demand for software engineers to be able to write the, the applications programs to make the chips do what they're supposed to do. So the next time you use uh, any of these products, uh, you will begin to know where they actually came from, uh, how we got there from the, from the sand through to the wafer technology and through to the design of the microchip chips themselves. And consider just how many engineers and scientists were involved in going through that process. And if you think, you know where this is going. Well, back in 2012, there were more connected devices than people on Earth. And in 2019, 40% of all Africans were online. And that means 525 million internet users. And, and also 75% of sub-Saharan Africa had access to SIM cards and mobile phones. So the amount of connectivity and things which are connected together is expanding enormously. And in, and in 2020, the number of connected devices is expected to be 50 billion devices. So that's six devices for every person on Earth. And it is still expanding further beyond that. There are some wonderful new developments in things like health electronics. Um, and my job at the moment is actually working on automotive electronics and connected cars. Uh, and that's a, another big area which is expanding rapidly. So, you know, in, in maybe another 20 years time, maybe it's 10 devices for, for every person on earth. But certainly the, the microchip business is going to be requiring engineers and scientists in the future uh, for as long as we can see. So thank you for that. I, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I believe I am uh, asked to, to take some questions, which I will happily do. So I will clear my screen and then uh, come back to the, the main screen. Thank you very much, Gordon, um, for a lovely presentation. Very intriguing, very interesting, very captivating knowledge as well. <laughs> Something to really consider when you're in your day-to-day -day lives. And Broadcom seems like an amazing foundation. It definitely is. And I'm hoping to see some questions from our audience um, regarding anything um, Gordon has said or um, maybe the foundation itself, if you have any or any of the work that he has done, if you have taken the liberty to Google him. And I'm hoping to see some someone asking something soon.
well, I guess this means the presentation was quite um, clear and um, very captivating, as I've already mentioned. Um, very interesting. We and we'd once again like to thank Gordon for your brilliant presentation. We're receiving many, many thanks from our audience, and um, they seem to have really thoroughly enjoyed your presentation. Thank you very much. It's it's always fun to do this with some school children because we usually get some children to stand up in front and, and show uh, some real wafers and things like that. But obviously, it's it's hard to do it online. Um, but uh, hopefully, uh, I, I've actually given this presentation in South Africa uh, a few years ago. So hopefully, I should get the chance to come back to Africa and do it again. Yeah, definitely. I'm sure our audience would appreciate that and would love to meet you in person as well. Thank you very much, Gordon. I can see the thank yous coming in, Ashley, but I can't see any questions. Yeah, um, that was a brilliant presentation from um, Gordon Lindsay. Um, I do not see any questions, so um, we'll rapidly um, move on to our next presentation. I hope you can all hear me quite clearly. Aha, that's a really interesting 
question as to, you know, as, as I said, a lot of the chips we make um, do very little without software. Um, some of the minor functions it can perform, uh, they, you can put some of the software functions actually embedded inside of the chip. So um, one of the areas I work on at the moment is actually Bluetooth technology. Uh, and, and actually, I work for Infineon now, not Broadcom. Um, but we have a chip which has the whole uh, Bluetooth software embedded inside of the chip so that we can make little sensor chips uh, for uh, automotive applications, uh, particularly things like tire pressure monitoring in cars, uh, where the whole chip can be embedded inside of the uh, tire uh, on a car and then can warn the driver if they have a puncture immediately or if the tires are actually flat. Um, and with that, what we do is we actually write the software and then embed the software actually inside of the, uh, the actual chip. So you can do things like that. Um, obviously, the more software you need to have, then you have to have additional memory chips to go outside of it. Um, but uh, quite often, you can you can actually make chips uh, that are sensors even without any uh, software built in. They're typically analog chips uh, and audio chips and things like this. Uh, they can process uh, the audio signals um, without any um, software whatsoever, but but just about everything else you can think of today, especially if it's if it's something which is working digitally, uh, it will have some kind of software uh, embedded in it in, in one shape or form, uh, and so yeah. It, quite often you'll find that microchip companies are sort of fifty percent engineers who design the chips. And then they may be as much as 50% engineers who actually write the software to go with those chips as well. So there's there's an awful lot of software engineering involved to, to, to get some of the things that we think of today.